Good morning. I guess it's good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Michelle Eichhorn, and I am a representative, and I work with physicians on getting patients diagnosed with genetic COPD, which is also called alpha-1 nephrotrypsin deficiency. Um, and in my quest to, um, to find these patients, I've heard so many pulmonologists and so many physicians ask me, did you ever know Dr. Sebath? Did you ever know Dr. Sebath? So one day I decided I was going to find out who the heck Dr. Sebath is. And so I did seek him out and uh, found him over at the health department, knowing that he was a former attending physician here at LSU. And um, talked to him about Alpha One, and he has uh, got some very interesting stories about how he was introduced to Alpha One, which I will let him tell. But I'm very honored to have him speaking um, on behalf of this disease state, which is very underdiagnosed. And I'm very thrilled to introduce him to you. He is a former attending physician here. He did his uh, fellowship over at National Jewish which is a center of excellence for Alpha One as well as today. And um, as many of you may know, he did his, um, he basically was a protege under Tom Petty, who is a, a legendary pulmonologist. And together, Dr. Sebus and Tom Petty uh, wrote some, some uh, pulmonary books, textbooks. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Sebath, and I hope that uh, you guys enjoy the program. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'll start by saying I hope this is a talk today. One of my favorite journals is the Wall Street Journal. And it had an article about 65 years ago that pointed out that physicians were paying 7% of a standard California recent patient. What do we do? We're eating, we turn off the light, and we eat dry. If I could reinvent my life, I would go back and have a different approach to trying to recreate what I consider is an important genetic event. Michelle referred to my introduction to alpha-1 nephrotrypsin. The reason I'm a pulmonologist today, I'm sure, is alpha-1. And because of this, when she asked me, I became uh, very nostalgic. I was a third year resident of internal medicine here, I think it was April and May, knew I wanted pulmonary medicine, had made a rotation at the University of Colorado in pulmonary medicine, arrived on a Tuesday. On Friday, uh, everybody, fellows and attendings went up to the Aspen at the FEMA conference. The interns and the residents came the Friday afternoon Colorado to get the beer. I was the only retarded individual that stayed around. Out comes Dr. Petty's secretary. Dr. Steve asked, would you look at this x-ray and help this doctor in the home? I'm sure she had no idea, but I'm a third year internal medicine resident in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I couldn't do anything else. I took the x-ray, looked it up, and it was the classic Honestly, I don't know how I was aware of it, but it was only a relatively recently discovered endocyte. I got on the phone and talked to the doctor and his wife, who they were going to do the surgery on uh, Monday morning. The 39-year-old had this horrible case here at the FEMA, and they were going to remove all the bone metamorphs, and she was going to live happily ever after. I said, don't let him do the surgery. This is going to be tough. Monday morning comes, and out comes Dr. Petty from his office like a bat out of hell, having been told what went on by his secretary. And what did you say? What did you say? I said, it's alpha-1 antitrypsin. I took the x-ray. I said, yep, you're right. I walked out. That afternoon, I got called to his office and asked how his family was. He said, I'm in back to Tulsa. which the residents at the University of Colorado didn't get to do. And ultimately, that's how I got a residency in internal medicine. I go back to the days of internal medicine. 
second uh, pulmonology training uh, in, in the profession. So I have a great love and that's going over to the uh, Marine Corps. COPD has always been an interest. I spend some time discussing it in general. It is the bread and butter of pulmonology. 80% of COPD is taken care of by primary care. important uh, about COPD to me is the fact that I'm going to die with a pulmonology son at our bedside at the age of 50. And I've been on a search for my career in pulmonary medicine to find out what really, uh, what, what's going on. And it's only been within the last 10 years that I think uh, I have a better understanding and I can tell you within the next few years you're going to have more medicines relief than I have had in my previous 30, 40 years in, in the practice of, of pulmonary medicine. So let's get on with it. The alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, I think probably most students have studied for board because it's always asked, because it's rare. Uh, I think the important part of this is the great majority of people are diagnosed, uh, have it, and the waiting period is very, very tender. In fact, I did a spokesperson for Dressel who has gone to pulmonologists here in town for several years for asthma, and when he was diagnosed with quick Parkinson's and everything was better, they suggested uh, timing this as alpha-1 antitrypsin. These are some of the statistics. It is uh, not necessarily a rare disease. Um, it is a genetic disorder. COPD has become the third leading cause of death, and up to 3% of patients uh, may have this genetic form. So what's happening? Well, you have neutrophil elastase release in response to infection and inflammation going into the body. And what do you do? You have antioxidants which negate the effect. It was in this very room a number of years ago that a hematologist from OU came over and he presented a coagulation cascade with Pac-Man. First time I ever understood it. But he has a red Pac-Man 12A chewing up this, going to the blue, and I remember that. So what do we have going on here? We have neutrophil elastase, we have protection, and in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, we have the excess of production, and I don't have the alpha-1 protein synthesis. So the neutrophil elastase goes on, chews up the lung, This is the deficiency, and this is why these people get premature and severe, severe emphysema. The excessive burn we discussed, the irritant we see with the smoking, uh, and they tend to have infections very, very common in these individuals. We're all aware that it can produce COPD. We are all taught that it causes a baseball flu. Well, we now know that a third of the cases have the upper lower extremities, but it does not lower them. And I can tell you as a pulmonologist, I always was looking for lower lobes and lungs. And that is not the entire problem. It can present as bronchiectomy. These people early can present as recurrent infection, chronic progressive cough. It can present as liver disease in children. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is uh, produced in the liver, and some small percent of people with involvement in children can have occasionally get a problem. It can cause liver cancer in, uh, with aging, and it can cause the necrotizing appendicitis. Uh, it's interesting. Is Mel still here? It 
it's, it's interesting because this disease was discovered by two pathologists in Scandinavia. And they were, at the first time, doing uh, serum electrophoresis. They found low alpha top one globulin, and they reported it. But then they started walking upstairs to see if they ever found it. And they found it was a single human tumor. So a year and a half later, I think 1965, they reported, hey, alpha-1 amitriptyline level uh, associated with emphysema. What are the symptoms? They're no different than anything else. These people have disc disease. Uh, the thing that also are the exercise tolerance, but they also have these. The second case that I had when I was a third-year resident here at the University of Colorado, we had a case that had very faintly presented all the cases, test competent. So they presented this case of asthma that was transferred up from Lamy Dow to Osteopathic Hospital in Colorado Springs, the show long in the city. And she had said, well, we don't think she's going to break it, so we have her in the break room. She'll be good to go and work on her. Two weeks later, she presented the same thing. They couldn't break it. What did she have? What did they see upon bronchoscopy? This is not a foreign body. Every time she exhaled, she was getting worse. Somebody said, wow, this is a 29-year-old with asthma. Maybe we ought to get her off of her prescription medication. And this is the first uh, unreported, reported, I don't know. There was nothing in the literature prior to this. But if you have asthmatics, something you would also want to consider early, that it may represent alpha-1 amitriptyline. Cough, acute in production, frequent lower respiratory problems with infection. Be aware of all this about older people. Take, let's, let's screen these people. It's, it's not uh, a common thing, but it's still a, something that should be thought of. Here again is, are the estimates. Uh, and I think the most important thing for me, early diagnosis and treatment is very important. The National Lung Health Study uh, was performed and followed people for a number of years. Normally, people would lose about 20 cc's of their FEV1 every year. Smokers can lose it in two to three times that, so they lost 60 cc's per year when they had two or three People with alpha-1 amitriptyline deficiency lost from 100 to 160 cc's per year. So if I'm waiting until they're on the end stage of their age, oh, I should have thought of that, they've already lost too much of their function. We need to start checking these people at a much, much earlier age. So I, this slide is interesting because in pulmonary literature right now, I'm reading more about pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, I did some studies uh, a number of years ago where they thought it might be transmitted to Canva because it's going for article in the New England Journal and out of Austria, one or two patients that responded. It didn't work. We still don't know why, but we now have metanidone, we now have hydroxyzocysteine, lots of stuff in the literature for fibrosis. I'm reading a lot about cystic fibrosis, a lot and a lot and a lot. But I will tell you one thing, I can't remember the last article I have seen within the last year or two on alpha-1 amitriptyline. And having lectured to a group of pulmonologists fairly recently, I can tell you they're not all of them say the same thing. Yeah, I think it's time to check. It's something that is really swept under our radar. So this is just a pie chart. People that have the MM normal, okay, those that are abnormal, and here's how they break out. The ZZ is the homozygous person that develops the problem. Uh, PIZF uh, problems. Uh, these are the individuals we're looking for and how it breaks out uh, genetically. So I think this chart is very, very important. Because this is longevity in the United States, and just a brief note.
article in every sale in the United States at the last count was at 76.2 years of age. The average female was 81.8 or something. But when you have you're losing a third can of 16 cc's per year, this is the mortality of people that have homozygous lesions and rapid loss of limb function. It's something Michelle pointed out to me and when she was here clinically, is what she called the pain. These people tend to do quite well. And then all of a sudden at 25, 30, they start having laminitis and they start wheezing. The doctor says, it's nothing wonderful. It's going to all get a little bit better. But about 35, the doctor starts to say, I can tell you, going back to a previous slide, if I identify the clear and start treating you, I am not losing a lot of 16 cc's per year. I am losing far less than that. In fact, I'm losing a very important part. So what does the uh, American Thoracic Society say? There are anyway, American Thoracic Society and European Society say they all have guidelines. By the way, uh, I will say about guidelines, my second favorite article, other than Japan, except for Ted, also came from the, the New England Journal. It says that guidelines should be written by clinicians, not academicians. When I'm sitting in my office as a pulmonologist at Harvard, how can I be writing the guidelines for Modigo, Oklahoma, that has a certain population. It should be written by clinicians. But here are the APS guidelines. Symptomatic COPD, symptomatic emphysema. Well, that's interesting because COPD is the term ostensibly that treats chronic bronchitis, chronic cough, and emphysema. I don't know. Um, I think that's redundant. People that have asthma, but it's not completely reversible on this therapy. Individuals that have persistent airway obstruction, uh, normal pulmonary function. The problem there is they're not in primary care physicians. They don't have doctors. I've lectured John Blue in some states. Um, it was Dr. Petty's point that we will not make any inroads into COPD until we can identify it early. Because a pulmonologist indicates to you when they have been told by their primary primary care to have a, quote, touch of emphysema, and I always say whoever touched them will collapse and carry this guy, but they're under a lot of pressure. There's nothing possible. You need to pick them up early. Um, and how do you do that? You do it with warning. I walk into your office with an exacerbation of 46. You do spirometry. Any spirometer to have lung aid. How old would I have to be to have my FEV1 be normal? Lungs of an 82 year old. Here is your steroid, your antibiotic, your anti-saccharide agent. Oh, we will do spirometry. You're down to 58. What do you think the chances of getting him to stop smoking are? Well, I can guarantee that it's not very high. Okay? This is a major, major mistake. You cannot do it. Actually, the Coleman caught on in Germany and they did the same age as I do. Pediatrician, family practitioner, came to me and said, I just cannot do this. I can't even get people in the office. All the guidelines say do it. APS, if you're 45 and older and smoke, you should have to be screened a lot. But do we do it here in the United States? We do not. These are just the levels, the homozygous CPP, which has a very low, but somehow, and I think Ted or 11 um, picobols is the level you don't want to be below that. Um, PI, PD, and the S. Now, these are important because alpha-1 antitrypsin, when we used to run the level, the serum level, people say, you can't have that. You can't have them again. They're coming into the office with a flare-up. Let's run them. They'll be higher. They test them a month later. They're either down to low level or they're in the hospital so that's what's important as far as phase reaction goes. But 
thing that's nice that I really respect for them is this. They have come out with a kit. Their kit is free. If there's any data to you, it will be a drop of blood, and you can screen your individual free of charge for alpha-1 and its constituents. We have in the, in the, what you're reading now, everything is going toward genetic. People are very aware of it. Somebody came up and I asked you, Blood, put it in an envelope, and send it off. They have an entire lab that they used to be associated with the University of Florida. It had to expand because they're so busy. But this is how this is uh, taken care of. And we may have questions for Michelle after this. Now this I'm, is interesting because the individual that you see is an employee of Triples who had uh, MZ, and he decided to go back and get some of his uh, family history. So here in red is the grandmother, who is homozygous ZZ, who died of uh, lung disease at age 48. They have children. One of them got a Z from the father, a Z from the mother, and so you have a ZZ. Um, and their children down the line, you can see that. The second group, you have an MZ and an MS, and so their children go down. On the other side, you have a Z and a Z, homozygous, and then look at their offspring. And we'll go down the type. This is one of the important things. We're now talking, entering into genetic time. Here is a disease process that I knew if I had a, a father who was MZ and a mother who was MZ, I would have a chance of having somebody who had hereditary homozygous ZZ as a kid and as a kid. How many problems were the death and so on, and that's not really true. If I knew that in advance, we could start treatment far earlier than, than we do, and we would not be using 116 CCs per year. This simply shows what we think of. Okay, the guidelines basically say severe emphysema is any time you have an FEV1 percent of predicted below 50%. That's severe, very severe, is below 30. Moderate emphysema is, is 50 up to 80. Well, this is what we think of. And these are the people, unfortunately, in our mind that we've been looking for. But they studied this, and this is individuals also that uh, were uh, smokers. And here were non-smokers. There are many people that it just doesn't enter our mind to, to check these individuals. So that is alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, I want to make some comments in general. The important thing I want to discuss, I think the, the uh, family testing and counseling is very important. And I think if you're screening to tell this may be important to your children, to your grandchildren, I, I think that's obvious. The lifestyle change with smoking cessation, uh, high blood sugar with smoking cessation, uh, whatever, it is still only about 10% of the population. Why? Milligram for milligram, nicotine is 10 times more than tobacco. It is the one that causes endorphins. You're seeing people jog over endorphins like this for 30 minutes. And then they'll pop and they'll go again. Very good for them. Unfortunately, there are e-cigarettes that are synthetic drugs. They just get the people to look at them. And they'll never use them again. 7% of people on their own perhaps doubled that, then they added Vibuprofen a little bit more, then you add Chantix a little bit more, but we're still talking 15, 20% of the deaths. 
long term. Everything that you read in the New England Journal or wherever will give you our six-week study when they have a nurse following them around every day in an ideal situation if they're on the medicine. And then if they stop, you go back to a very, very low uh, success rate. The article I always refer back to is from the New England Journal a number of years ago. It basically said that the success rate with most of these patients, number one, is the nurse. Why? Because if that patient is coming in and you need care and they're thinking, the odds of this going well are much, much I used to admit, well, how many times does it take? It takes eight attempts for people on an average to come to me. What happens? Okay, I'm two months over, three months over, great. I'm really doing well. My wife runs away with the money. This is a good place for her to be. She wants a warm place. Okay? And what's the next thing that happens? Oh, my God, I went shopping three to four months. I came up with some patients. Oh, my God, I can afford to pay for this place. And it's always been hard with the small beginnings. And I used to be convinced that this can happen, John. I wanted to be sure that this was true. I was indeed the one that was uh, supposed to be doing it. The other thing I want to say is um, the lung aid is a geometry. There have been three article, articles out of the European literature that have shown that this say also in the audience is Dr. Wolf, who I gave a lecture on spirometry to a few years ago, and he called me, got one, he called me a couple of months later and says, I have known how much you need to be in existence and how long I will have to restrict you. I hope you don't mind me using your name, but it's true. Ten percent of our population has COPD. Ten percent has asthma. One in five physicians, one in five patients we see are blind or have Exercise, uh, everybody knows, you know, you're a boy irritant. Alcohol, we have done some research that shows the amount of alcohol that is safe to help work the other one. I burned that one, that's not one of my favorites. Uh, vaccination, what's new? Because of liver involvement, hepatitis A, B, great. What have we learned? Influenza. A number of years ago, I was lecturing on this, and the guy my lecture was COPD, and I, I said, I usually immunize the first three shots of my liver and the two weeks before that. Why? Because sometimes we get it early. October flu, sometimes we have a flu shot. If I get it early, I'm doing fine. If I wait until, oh, the CDC recommends, you know, late November to December, okay, then I'm not doing well. And so I get two shots. The guy got up afterwards and said, the CDC is recommending that I not take it. I said, well, you you have a plan. You see what I did? And the next year, and whether this has anything to do with it or not, I don't know, but it started paying off. People are getting sick from the flu. The other thing that's happened, and, and you may want to consider that a stay at five days a week. Pneumococcal back, uh, the other thing that's happened is over the last few years, we've had quadruple strength. And what they discovered in this old framework, the mean strength is like they used to do quadruple growth and they did it wrong. What would I do if I was 60 years old and COPD? Here was a guy that was healthy. A guy back in Boston sitting on his desk was not going to have this happen. I would take the higher dose of vaccination. In fact, I paid for it and my wife got one shot. And our insurance wasn't going to cover it. Pneumococcal just came out. We were always taught that pneumococcal vaccination is great, and once you're past six or past seven, it doesn't really work. Within the past six months to a year, they discovered that rhubarb, or excuse me, OP jacket was bad. Now you're going to lose it. So you lose that in this randomization. Okay, drug therapy. You're going to see more stuff come down the pike uh, in the next couple of years. 
abundance of years than he had in the past. The Bronco Dilator says, your airway is held in constant tone by the sympathetic system saying open up, the parasympathetic system uh, close down. So what do we do? Long-acting bronchodilators open up, the anticholinergics don't close down. Years ago we had in the mid-80s albuterol was introduced. Very good. Shortly thereafter, short-acting open up, activate, don't close down. What did they discover? Combining them together was better than either group of them alone. And throughout the 80s and early 90s, Combifen was the most popular. What happened then? Tell John Marner out of Dartmouth in the year 2000, experiment, long acting open up, short acting activate, don't close down, better than either group of these alone. In 2007, Org. We now have Theravin open up. We have Skyriva. Don't close down. Better than either group of these three alone. What you're going to be seeing is not all you can drink. That's all you have to drink. You're going to have a combination. There are a study, a neural has been released. Uh, they compared the single components, the bronchodilator, uh, which is the lanterol, with the anticholinergic, each of them got about 100 milligrams of anticholinergic. The combination of these two drugs alone is better than either group. The people who keep them really don't want to take them. Another pharmaceutical company is coming out with hypochelonium and imipatalin. And uh, Barrier is coming out with oligoterol, and they're going to combine it with group one. So you're going to see. Steroids, what are steroids? I said, I, I treated in a study of this most of my life, part of my life as an artist. The drug, or the, the article that gave me a, an epiphany was from 2008 by John Finn Maxine, Canadian investigator, studying what happens when people invoke steroids. What keeps them from coming back? They're trying to save money. What they discovered, they went through the records of followed 72,000 or 120 patients and they admitted for an examination of the two of them to the hospital and there was a 25% reduction in the observation of the two of them in the hospital. The thing that gave me a little hope was that my attempt to treat the pain of those patients was going to save them all of that money. So here is the role just a recent study of this that long-acting anticholinergics, Skyriva, Restorative, the others that are going to be coming out, they had a 14% reduction in observation. Long-acting bronchodilators, we don't drink them. Some of them had a 15% reduction uh, in observation. And So what are we seeing? Where would he use steroids? People who have steroid resistance. The second article that came out that same year, 2000, in 2002, was Thorax, written by Donaldson. Donaldson showed that each one of these active ingredients accelerates the flow of water through the system. I said for years, I taught the Fletcher Keto Curve. On this axis, I had your FEV1. This is your age, and we all lose lung function as we age these things. We get older, the COPD leaves it at, at 15, 16, 17. I, I taught this 31 years, the Fletcher Keto curve. I said, why? And this is the article. Each one of those exacerbations accelerates the prime receptor activation. And I should have picked up on that myself, but I did not. Why should have I? Patient after patient would come in and say, Dr. Seabass, you, you know that episode I had a couple months ago? I just had that happen to me again recently. And that's exactly what they did. And that's why we have to be more aggressive in treating these people with those drugs. So what are the guidelines now? They're talking 
about the king and his son have to come and speak about God's return and his day and he will destroy the army of God. Not having lots of assassination and starving the Jews and all of that. So worship and your son. So that's the story I am giving. The other thing that's to me the most important is the religious part. And I don't know how these others have come along. Why is it a short of life to want to use it? If you come into my office and I say, Sir, I'm going to give you more than you realize you don't want to give me. Why? I have a religion. It's the only thing that works. What about check the mail? Or short of wrapping? How often do you get a mail? Did you know, sir, that it doesn't take 20 minutes to ask? always been sent. I know there were hundreds of people who walked out of my office who thought I was a card cheat. Why are they short of breath? Because I said, Mammy, I have been studying this. When I walked in to get the mail, I had mailed it 500 BC. I had sent a mail in with it. I checked it out. I let it in. I checked it out. I let it in. I checked it out. And when I get to the mail, I designed in my office hallways, uh, boxed in containers, put in tight little round bags, always in short of breath. I'm not going to let you drop it. I don't want to get sued. And we're going to get the mail. And I just walk up and down and stand there, no puff puff. Religion. See, any time, that took me years to discover this. See, any time you have something to deliver that you really feel is holy, long-acting, once-made moth of Iowa. So if I got neither of those containers, and I just puff, puff, I didn't get the mail with the right information. Nothing. Puff, puff. Nothing is really holy. Something is really holy is this one. Antibiotics. There was an article in CBN in the New England Journal uh, July two years ago that these things are high, so low dose. Once daily for a year. And you know what they discovered? The basic masturbation. Jump in the bandwagon. Sleep. Sleep is very popular in the West. Maybe we should do this in the East. You need to get an EKG for 402G every before and every three months for the first time. Okay? You need to get a hearing test every three months for the first year. How many Zip a loop. Two weeks later, the FDA almost put uh, a black box warning and nebulized for the COVID vaccine. So you read these articles in the New England Journal and whatever, and you think, yeah, I'm good. But is it good? And do you have anybody that's going to come in and see you every three months, get a hearing test, and get a zip a loop? Pulmonary rehab is great. What's the problem? They show up at base 14, they do a study on an average. They've done studies that the majority of people stop after their treatment rehab, and at the end of a year, they're back affected and they can't even walk. Very few can go on with the rehab fully. Surgical procedures, uh, lung reduction surgery, transplant, huge growing transplant. We're doing now is I hope they'll look at the CTC in the front body of the supply here. It is localized, lower load. Really, only about 15% of the people with emphysema and COP really respond or are candidates for the lung reduction surgery. So that's comments in general. Uh, so what are we doing with Alpha One? Here's our patient, and we're just replacing them with replacement therapy uh, with our alpha-1 amitriptyline, and it has given 60 
uh, milligram kilograms of ferrous. We want a level above 11. I don't know where that holds us. If some people in Boston decide we need to go above 11, because of this next slide, this is what happens. I am given an infusion. I have an alkaline and quicksilver tie. I go to 70 degrees of heat. Honestly, if it was me or my daughter, where would I want this? I want 70 degrees of heat. And I think as we get more and more patients are discovered and uh, do more research, I think the infusion has changed because they do not have to lose 160 or 60 degrees. Safety information, uh, I'll let you read. Um, and I mentioned, I just, I just read something recently um, that was in, was in the July um, check. And it basically was an article that all people have to be differently hospitalized this afternoon. By the way, if I'm hospitalized for my first exacerbation, COPD, there is a place for this remedy in the United States. There is a remedy that is poison. And I can remember seeing people on cell phones talking about this happening. Flare up and they find bronchitis. They had to put me in and put my little tent in. I have no clue what that is all about. that lived in the hospital with an exacerbation ever got back to their primary care doctor within 30 days. And what they're seeing is very high readmission. And if the government is seeing high readmission rate, oh, we're not going to pay for this. Okay? And they went in, they went on off the meds, everything they wanted to do. The other thing that, that really caught my attention is the very little follow-up caring for me in the hospital. In the olden days when I trained and when I practiced, the primary care doctors were coming in to see me. Okay? They love their primary care doctors. That's why they go to them. So I'm going to dismiss them or they dismiss them. They're back to see me in a week. They're going to come back. They don't know me. I'm rushed. I've got 52 people to see. Are they going to go back and see them? No. Do they ever get a report and summary? Follow up within several days? No. This is one of the reasons that we can hold a high exacerbation rate, and it's something that really should be trucking and putting in the phone book and putting in the hospital system. If I'm a hospital, I better call that doctor, and I better tell him, you get to see him in a week, and that doctor's office should know, let me better call him to do this work. Because what's going to happen is going to be readmission, readmission, readmission. Much, much higher than what it should be. And I think I've stopped there. Are there questions? Yes, sir. Dolly Rest and the Oscar. Yes. Dolly Rest was a drug uh, that uh, Pumalas, I was looking forward to it. I am an old Theophilin man. Silomylas and Pumalas. Silomylas, I had the one from Journal, which dropped and did a cardiac toxicity or something. But well, Pumalas came out. It was developed in Europe. It entered Europe, and the European FDA pushed it. The European FDA turned it down, saying, we already have medical drugs for this drug. Okay? Still has not been released to Europe. It was introduced to this country only during the provision of FDA. It was turned down because we already have a federal drug for this. They have two months to recertify or to resubmit, which they did. Only a pediatric committee of meeting at the time will accept it. And that's how it got here. Significant GI toxicity, $150 for this add on to everything else. And with their own data, it only I'm big on aminophilin because, and I'm still using it, 
for a number of years, I did this POV clinic at uh, Cleveland across the way. And it was my 20th week as a guest as a VA patient at this hospital. And I just thought that was it. Okay? It was me and COVID. Recently, they discovered the thing that turns off infection in the lung, inflammation, is histone deacetylase 2. Histone deacetylase 2 is decreased by its malevolence the smoke. And what they discovered is that aminophthalene, which is the histone deacetylase 2 level uh, concentration, even at low doses, and they were using it at low and chronic doses. And initially it was done in rat and mouse studies. I have a second article in uh, Newman on the histone deacetylase 2. What would I do if I had them on? Open up. Don't close down. I had a steroid on board prevent exacerbation. And by the way, there is prachygalactic in the lung, which is my oncology. I have an expert in that. Steroids help regulate the renal receptors, so it helps with perfusion. The long-acting beta-2 increases the transmission of steroid molecules into the nucleus. So those three are all carcinogenic. If I had them all, three of them, the next thing I would add is USP and monoclonal antibody milligrams twice daily. And it costs all of eight or ten bucks a day for one of those. I think the VA people were telling me they knew that aminophthalene does seven things to the lung that the worm can do. The elevation prevents diaphragmatic fatigue. It's a modulator of anotropic activity and transmission. It would be the bell guy that I would I would add. And you don't need to run the level test. Anybody still awake? I said it would be short. I apologize. Um, any other questions? The other thing, let me say one thing that you can do for your patients. We call it emphysema. There's a simple name recognition with COPD. No idea what it means. Oh, I have a little bit of pipes. You say emphysema, and they conjure up somebody pushing hard on oxygen. What happened years ago? We called it emphysema. Oh, it could be a pure emphysema. You have a pure bronchitis, you have a pure emphysema, but the majority are in the middle. So let's call it COPD. For two years, they argued in the literature whether we should call it COLD or COPD, lung disease insurance. That's how they get rid of COPD. So what happened? So now we have COPD, virtually no name recognition. I say, you've got emphysema. Eyes get big, you can get their attention. Oh, maybe you've got some early stages. Those are early stages of the DNA of sodium. Quadruple by success rate for smoking in this patient. If you call it emphysema, you're taking every patient wrong. Emphysema is a morphologic diagnosis. You have to see it in the right mind. Uh, anybody in their right mind who can lie down and have an open lung biopsy and prove you wrong, you know, they're they're going to be in the mental institution before they're three years in our mental institution. You're doing these people a favor because they appreciate the gravity of the situation. And I think we as pulmonologists made a major mistake having this nice little comfortable term, COPD. It does in the very first article in the International Journal of Renal Disease, the very first issue, the very first article, back to back. No name recognition for COPD. There is name recognition for COPD. Because I will stop there. I think uh, if anybody's interested in the kit, the clinics are interested. I can talk to Michelle. They provide these free of charge. I would think in my office, if I offer somebody a free genetic test, to rule it out, it costs nothing, it's probably what, you know, I should be on board for offering. I thank you very much.